What's up, everybody? Welcome to SWAT MMA. This is episode number 162. I'm Jared here with Paul. What up? Coming to you from Las Vegas, Nevada. Today, we are joined by BKFC bantamweight champion Reggie Educated Hands Barnett, who is defending his title at BKFC 39 on March 24th. Paul and I will also be discussing BKFC 38 and UFC 286, Edwards versus Usman 3. But before we're joined by Reggie and the rest of the combat sports, you know what time it is. Grab your stash, fire it up. Let's get into the weed of the week. Smoke weed every day. All right, guys. I just lost a lung. You didn't sound too hot hitting that. <laughs> We've got all kinds of little Ooh. things in front of us. So, yeah, we got a lot of stuff here today. Um, we got, we'll start with the weed. Yeah, this weed looks nice, man. It's dark, We've it's got purple, it's green. Some uh, white straw truffles, seed. which is a phenotype of gorilla butter. Mm. Uh, gorilla butter is a cross between peanut butter breath and gorilla glue number four. Peanut butter breath and gorilla glue number four. That's nice. No wonder I'm liking this uh, strain so much. Yeah. I fuck um, with both those strains individually. They're good. Yeah. It's really, like, nice buzz. So you can see, like, that Gorilla Glue, like, lineage in there just by its, like, density, you know? Got some Sour Tangy by Select in this vape pen right here. Although, I'm a little iffy about this one. And let me tell you why. I'm curious what our listeners might think. Sound off in the comments. I was reading the ingredients for this particular vape pen, and it says it contains cannabis extract and botanical terpenes. So what that means is they are not cannabis-driven terpenes. They are botanical, which means any type of plant. So basically the limoline, for instance, that's in this, which is strong, it's got a very strong orange flavor, is from uh, orange oil. I don't know how I feel necessarily about vaping that. I know it's natural, but does that mean you want to Heat it up and inhale the fumes. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. That's Let's very interesting, it. right? <laughs> I've just. I've often wondered that because I know some companies add botanical extracts like this, and some companies use Holy cannabis shit. only extracts. See how orangey that is? Yeah, it's like super orangey. Yeah, it's like an orange tic tac. Exactly, and that is why. So. Curious what our listeners think of that. What do you think of that, Paul? I'm up in the air about it. I just don't know. I don't really know if it's bad for you, so I don't really know. But. We'll do some research and find out. What do you got in this other vape pen you got right there? Uh, some live resin, some gelato. Pretty fire. Now, live resin, we've gone over that several times on the show, but if you're unfamiliar, it is simply the, the cannabis, I mean, sorry, the THC and the terpenes extracted while the plant is still live, so they freeze it. They take a live plant and they freeze it. And then they do the extraction. So it's more flavorful. The terpenes come through with a uh, stronger potency usually. Yeah. And the, it just mainly the flavor profile is up quite a bit. And that would be the exact opposite of the flavor this, in this one because all that is coming from terpenes that are in the cannabis. Yeah. And nothing added. This mm -hmm. would be added botanical terpenes. Yeah, this one, uh, I think it was like a 92% THC or something like that. It's pretty fire. All right. Well, we want to thank Binoid CBD and the UFC store. You can get good deals at both of those places if you simply go to our website or click on the links in the description below and follow the links from there. You're going to help out the show and save a little bit of cash. Joining us today is Reggie Barnett Jr., the BKFC's bantamweight champion who is defending his title on March 24th at BKFC 39. Reggie, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us today. Thank you guys so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Ooh. Absolutely. Now, before we talk about your upcoming title defense, we'd really like to give our listeners a chance to get to know you a little bit. Um, now, I know your dad was a decorated amateur boxer. <laughs> I know he owns a 757 boxing club. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood, growing up in kind of a fighting family, and, and what that was like? Um, I have good, I always, I always call it being both sides of the fence, you know. My parents, I've never wanted or needed for anything, for real. 
Um, other than I guess attention. <laughs> I found it in some of the wrong places. Um, I had a pretty good childhood. Uh, my teenage years were really rough. Uh, some of it, my own doing, my own decisions. My late teens and early 20s were absolutely a wreck uh, because of the choices that I made. Uh, you know, just my gang activity and uh, being out in the streets and just being a thug and a hoodlum. Uh, Did you get in a lot of fights when you were growing up? Heck yeah. Heck yes. Uh, shoot. I fought almost every week, if not every other day or something like that. And then you know, when I, I joined the gang, I was kind of like their little mini enforcer slash uh, problem solver. The way we did it. Get your dog. Thank you. Um, they kind of like if there was a problem or a, a, I guess a disagreement or whatever between gangs or even within the gang, you know, they picked somebody to go and fight another person and you know whoever won the fight would settle that dispute. Well, that person nine times out of 10 got chosen to go fight with me. You know? Everybody knew I fight. I did a lot of underground street fighting before the whole Kimbo slice there. Okay. When I got out of prison smartphones, um, that just came to life fruition. When I went to prison, we had flip phones and razors and little Nokia, you know, little box Nokia phones and stuff like that. So wasn't too much recording the fighting, but um, I, I did a lot of fighting on the streets, backyards, garages, freaking, oh man, I fought down at the ocean front on the beach before, just a knucklehead, but I, I always loved fighting, and for me, it was like just the rawest form of, of selling in the street, you know, anybody can pick up a gun and shoot somebody, that's easy, and walk away, but truly having to deal with that that person, man to man, mono to mono was always my, we call it shoot the barrel. And I, and I still stick by the acronym here at home. You know, if you truly have a problem with somebody to the point where you feel like, you know, it's gonna turn into life ending violence, you can hit me up. And as long as the other person you beef and what agrees to, I'll let y'all come to the gym and shoot the barrel. So, so that way both parties can walk away. Um, and, and we only had three, I had started like three years ago. We've only had three cases, but each time the people who were involved, they're really close friends now. So, so and some of my closest friends are people that I got this place with. That's the funny thing about fighting another person when you when you let out all that anger and you and you both square up like that, when it's all over, a lot of that animosity goes away and you can kind of develop a bit of a, a almost feeling of brotherhood, right? Yep. And and it establishes a level of respect whether you want to lost for that person. For sure, absolutely. That's a lot better way to settle disputes than, like you were saying, you know, with pistols or other weapons. For sure. Um, what about amateur boxing? Did you do much amateur boxing? Um, we're still disputing my amateur record, but I finished with like somewhere in 120 something amateur boxing matches. Okay. Um, my dad was in the military when I was young, and you know, he'd be gone for six months, and then he'd come home, and he would run up and down the east coast fighting as many events and tournaments as we could before he left again that's where i got a lot of my amateur career was when i was young we show up and weigh in on wednesday and fight thursday friday saturday to sunday if we made it to the championship and we do it one weekend take a weekend off and right back to it the next weekend uh, we'd go up to Maryland, D.C. I would fight on Friday and then fight again on Saturday and we'd come home. So it just gave me a way to get a lot of amateur experience in, in a quick amount of time. But I lost my first seven amateur boxing matches. I was really that good when I started out. So. Sure. I, I lost. I was an amateur boxer. I lost my first two. It's kind of hard to stick with it after that. I think it's... uh. It shows a lot. You lose seven and you st keep coming back and then now look where you're at, you know. For me, it wasn't even really a matter of like winning or losing. It was I enjoyed that that rush, that feeling of, of competing and being in a fight. And so even when I was losing, I was like, Dad, can we do that again? 
And like, oh, you, you need to go back and work on some things. And you know, I go back to the gym, work on what was suggested to me. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, I just want to fight. <laughs> was it kind of expected that you would become a professional boxer as you got older? No. Um, crazy story. We went down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina to, for, a, I think it was my second or third professional MMA fight. And a lot of people don't know that when I was doing pro MMA, I was taking fights on short notice just to feed my family because I had got out of prison and nobody wanted to uh, uh, give me a job. Uh, I applied at a lot of places and I couldn't find a job. And so I was like, well, at least I got these hands, at least I know how to fight. So I just started doing pro MMA and that's why I could feed my family and move us out the hood essentially or where they lived at. Um, it was not a really good place, but um, I just enjoyed, you know, doing it. I wanted to take care of my family and do what I needed to do for them. But I sucked at MMA. People say, oh, you're a great MMA fighter. And I felt like I sucked. <laughs> I just fought the fight. Did you, um, now see, you, you've had professional MMA bouts. You've had professional boxing bouts and obviously professional bare knuckle what is it about bare knuckle that really kind of got you settled in and focused on that? Because you've had, what, 10 fights in BKFC, right? I think you've had more than anybody. Uh, now me and Lorenzo Hunt are tied since his okay. fight tied to the bench. But me and Lorenzo have the most, most BKFC fights on record. Um, and I just, I don't know, when they had the first call for the tryout and bare knuckle, I was like, Dad, that's it. Uh, the, the the times that I could have died out there on the streets doing things I had absolutely no business doing. Um, I was like, that's what God spared me for. That's what he was preparing me for. And uh, he's like, we're boxers. We're not, we're not, you know, because he didn't even support me when I started doing MMA. I snuck off right when I turned 18, drove five hours, I flat kicked in 30 seconds. <laughs> so, um, but I went to the tryout. I showed out. I knew hands down. That I was the best fighter at the the first ever PKFC tryout. Like, no disrespect to any of my other guys that were there. But hands down, I was the best prospect at that time. Um, and kind of the rest is history. I, I fell in love with the sport. I want to say after the Clay Burns fight, uh, I was like, you know what? I can make this my sport in essence of it's still young it's still growing let me push the boundaries develop the skills that i want to use within it um so and that's what i've done every fight i've, I've evolved i've gotten better i've brought something new to the table oh uh, man we got something something real nice and uh i don't even know what the word is i can't wait to to use it uh, in my upcoming but i just i just fell in love with the sport and you know, i'm grateful to the BKFC and Dave Feldman and everything behind him that, you know, he didn't give up. It took him a while, you know, to get where he wanted as far as the sport because he didn't give up on his vision and dream. I get to live by. Yeah, there was a lot of pushback against BKFC when it first started. And then there was that other bare knuckle promotion that wasn't paying fighters. I remember when, when you know, back in yeah, the day. We don't, we don't give credit to other promotions, but yeah, there was a couple promotions out there that not running, uh, I guess, their business side of, of things the way that it's supposed to be. But I mean, you know, there was so much pushback. I got pushback from the ladies. I grew up going to church. So when, when I told them I wasn't going to do pro boxing and uh, I was going to bear enough, they didn't have anything really nice to say to me in regards to that. They thought in their minds that I was going back to being that thug and that street fighter, you know, that I was when I was post or pre-prison and all that, but I just, I had a vision in my mind and I knew at some point, as long as I continued to work hard enough that I would be champion, but it's not about being champion. It's just about being a representation of God's power because I haven't done this all right. Um, we're humans. I lose my direction every now and then, but when I find God and, and I truly believe in the path that he set for me, it's when I, I become better, not just as a fighter, but as a person. And it shows whenever I get in that squared circle. Absolutely. Um, you, you've mentioned, you know, 
Well, a lot of pro boxers, it seems like they look at bare knuckle and they think they're going to come in and have immediate success due to that boxing experience, kind of like uh, Pauli Malignaggi or former opponent of yours, Demarcus Corley, uh, you know, who had like, what, 90 professional fights and, you know, you handily beat him uh, in bare knuckle at BKFC 16. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the two sports? I mean, obviously the gloves aren't there, but it's a completely different thing that a yeah. lot of people don't yeah. seem to yeah. understand. I mean, the pace, the aggressiveness, you know, the the exertion, um, even just at a certain point, if you're not throwing punches or what, right, and you're hurting your hands, you have to be willing to hurt yourself to continue to hurt your opponent. And getting hit, getting hit with a pair of bare knuckles is different. I can hit you over and over and over again with a pair of boxing gloves and not hurt my hand. Um, but after a while, like I said, uh, if I'm not hitting you in the right spots at the right time, I'm, I'm going to hurt myself just as much as me trying to hurt you. Um, sure. And then the clinch fighting is, in which I I want to say I'm probably one of the most adverse fighters as far as when it comes to the bare knuckle clinch. Uh, is, is, is one of my staples and one of the things. It's that dirty part of boxing that they always, you know, you look know, I'm a student of fighting. I watch fights from the from the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, uh, I don't know how much tape I watch, but if you look back at the old school fighting back in the the 40s and the late 30s, they allowed them to fight in the clinch. You know, you could hold the arm and hit your opponent. You could swing him and hit him and all that. But as the Queensbury's rules evolved and all that, uh, it kind of got taken away from boxing. And so now you see two guys clinch and break, 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 break. You know, as long enough to whoop you behind in the clinch, then you know, the fight continues in bare enough. And I love that. So I went and found ways to utilize that where I'm still beating you up and you can't even beat me up. So the fight doesn't, you know, get broken or stopped in mid action. Hell yeah. Um, you mentioned a little bit, you know, about the hands. Are you do you find yourself doing like hand strengthening exercises or anything to toughen up the knuckles so when you get into the squared circle, they're maybe not, you know, quite so painful or, or prone to breaking? It, it, it look, from where I was the first bare knuckle fight, I was punching brick walls uh, <laughs> three minutes a day, every day, up into the fight, about a month out, trying to condition my hands, and I still broke both my hands. <laughs> so. So we go back and we're like, all right, well, what did we do wrong? You know, how can we, you know, conditioning, you know, for the hands. And there are several good conditioning techniques that you can use in order to sustain the longevity in the sport. Yeah. Keep your hands. But at the same time, big bones break little bones. So you can have all the intention of not hitting in a big bone and catch it anyway. So what do you do then? You just right. have to go through and continue to deal damage but yeah well we have a few few techniques that i've used that that i found that truly do prepare and condition your hands to take the damage and to give the damage out but i'm not giving them all no no that's for sure yeah um so let's talk a bit about your fight coming up so on the 24th you're fighting gustav center mom in a title of defense for yourself how does it feel not only to be champion but to have uh how do you feel about your opponent coming up um, he's a good fighter, you know, as far as his toughness, his tenacity, his drive, you know, he's a great fighter, but when we talk about skill level preset, there's levels to this to this game. Um, there's levels to fighting, and I feel like, I'm not saying he's below me, I just say he, I don't think he's there yet, and I'm still only getting better. I'm not, okay. I haven't done coming into the fighter that I'm gonna be. That's the cool thing about bare knuckle yeah. is we can all literally see this sport evolving yes. as it's growing because that's the only way wanted, to really learn. Yeah. That's why I wanted to be a part of it. It was you know, boxing is boxing and, and it is gonna be what it boxing is until the end of time. I don't see you know, they were talking about adding more rounds or this and that and some of the aspects of it, but it doesn't change what boxing is. Uh, bare knuckle is still evolving. It, it's still evolving, and I'm trying myself to push the boundaries and find ways to be a part of that evolution. You know, that's what the educated hands 
and you see it. I, I, I've watched fights, and I see guys, I guess, use my moves, as we call them, you know, some of my techniques. And it's like, well, I know whose fights they were watching. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and with that being said, do you feel like it just gives you even more of an, just a natural advantage knowing that you have, I mean, you, you're tied for the most fights ever in BKFC history, but having that experience in there that some of your opponents just aren't going to have naturally? Yeah, yeah I mean, because we talk about the lights and the show and, and all that stuff too, you know, that is something that also you have to be able to deal with and, and oversee and for me, this is going to be my first fight at home in a long time. But when we talk about the bright lights and the, the, the all that that moment, I feel like that very first fight with Johnny Beckford it kind of froze me. Um, but now, it's learning to embrace it and live in that moment because those moments in life you don't get there too often. They come few far in between. So to be defending my world title at home in front of my friends and my family and my fans and the people that watched me grow up, the people who saw me at my highest and the people who have seen me at my absolute lowest. Um, I'm excited to just go out there and be me and have fun. And as they say, put on for my city. <laughs> Even though I'm not really from Norfolk, uh, all of all of the seven cities, seven by seven, was kind of my stomping ground. I've done good things and bad things in every <laughs> every part of Hampton Roads you possibly could. So. Um, so, with that also being said, I feel like we've seen this new trend in, in BKFC where a lot of the champions that have become somewhat dominant, and I feel like with you having this experience, you've kind of fought a lot of the better guys in the division. Do you see yourself trying to become a multiple division champion, or you just want to continue your, your reign over the bantamweight division? Yes. We all do what we need to do, and we'll look towards the next the next weight class when it comes. You know, like right now, we're talking almost two weeks out from the biggest fight of my life, so my focus is Gustav. Uh, I'm not looking past him in any meter. I know he's coming from across the world to try to take what is mine. Uh, but yeah, down the room, you know, we have plans on moving around a little bit, trying to shake some things up in the BKS. How has this fight camp and preparation been going for you? And are you training out of 757 exclusively, or do you bounce around a little bit? Um, I have two, well, I want to say I have three main um, gyms or however you want to go. So of course my home gym is 757 Boxing and Fitness. My father built that gym for me and we have been building champions and changing lives because it's not just about fighting. We've had people come and go to the gym who have gone on to do other great things and different precepts of their life. That is for me the biggest standpoint in 7 by 7 box. So the lessons you learn there, you take with you and you carry into anything in life that you're willing to put the work behind. It. And then um, I train over at Grindstone Athletics, which is in Virginia Beach. Uh, which I thought was funny. It's literally on the same street that our gym was. Our gym was on Cleveland Street, and I went to prison. And when I got out, our gym was in Chesapeake. Well, Grindstone is on Cleveland Street, right down the street from where our gym used to be. And I, um, me and Chase Walden and, and Tom Lanehart, we, we've gone and in, in, been in the same combat circles, you know, for a long time, but we never really spoke or talked. You know, they kind of more did Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu. And then uh, kind of put our heads together, and and I tell Coach Tom he's my strength and conditioning coach. That every every camp I get stronger, and with more strength comes more speed. And then me and Chase we're like alchemists when it comes to this fair no. How how can we take clinch fighting from all aspects of combat and implement it into our bare knuckle training, our bare knuckle fighting? Uh, and then I have my Sifu, Rob Doggett, who is uh, the JKD process. And I've been a martial artist my entire life. So we got together and you know, we take everything that we've been, I've been learning and improving all my boxing, my, my clinch fighting, you know, even a little bit of my grappling. And we blend it all together and we find the best ways to strengthen those techniques. A lot, a lot of people know before the Gene Herrera fight, 
Rob comes in and he's like, hey, you, you, you ever done any blindfold, you know, training practicing? And I'm like, yeah, a little bit. We dabbled, but not. And so he said, well, I'm going to finish out these last two weeks just, just honing your senses. He said, if you lose your eyes, you know, let's be able to fight with everything else. And lo and behold, that Gene poked me in the eye in the first round. Oh. And it hurt so bad in the second round I, to still try to open my eye that I just closed my eyes and went with it. Like I fought the whole second round of the Gene Herrera fight blind by choice. You know, you get hit in the eye so hard that you can't even open the other one because the water is stiff. Oh, that's, yeah. that's how it was. And I don't know. And, and I always tell Rob, you're a messenger from God for me. Wow. It was something we practiced, something we went over in training, and we needed it in a moment where I truly, truly needed it. I had it, and I used it. So we we all work together as a team. I tell them, I said, y'all, I'm just a tool. All I am is a tool. Y'all are the mechanics and the, and, and the shapers behind this tool. And then I just go out and function the way y'all have prepared me to you mentioned being a lifelong martial artist, and you mentioned uh, JKD, which for our listeners who may not know is Jeet Kune Do, obviously yeah. started by Bruce Lee. And if I understand things correctly, your Sifu trained directly under Lee, is yes. that correct? Yes, he did. He trained directly under um, Bruce Lee in his lineage. And then... Uh, I think that's awesome. Ago, that's, yeah, yeah that's dope. really cool. A couple of weeks ago, uh, his grandmaster, uh, McThorpe, came up, and we worked on some things. And he kind of sharpened a few tools, and I went back out and sparring, and I was lighting people up with them, like devastatingly. I was I was shocked. Like when I hit it, I call. I got a, when practice is over, I called Mick. Yeah, he didn't pick up, but I was just so excited to tell him that I, I was able to take what I've learned again and improve on that. And I guess essentially we call it evolving. Every fight, I'm, I'm shot to evolve. You know, as a fighter and as a person, those things have to conjunct and go together in order to get a, it's a performance to me. Everybody else is so like, oh, it's a fist fight. For me, the opera, the ballet, figure skating, whatever, for me, it's a, that, that 10 minutes out there is, is a performance to me. It doesn't matter what you put in front of me. I'm going out there to perform for myself, for God, and for the people who believe in what I can do. Well, God, it like- in myself. <laughs> It sounds like you're bringing that martial arts mentality into the squared circle, which is which is a good thing to see. Yeah, because most guys just approach it like a fist fight, or, or yeah. it's like a fight. And in all actuality, this is hand to hand combat. You know, they can call it bare knuckle fighting championships, but when you strip away a title, you strip away all that, and it's just me and you, these two hands. That's all I got. It's a hand to hand combat fight, and that's my approach. What can I use? What do I know? What can I add to my own personal hand-to-hand combat skills to beat you up with my bare knuckle? As people can tell, you're definitely a student of the game. So who would you say, like, growing up or even now are some people you may have, like, used and took in pieces of their styles to try to build and uh, make your style even better? Oh, there's already five fighters off um, Marvin Hagler. Arby Leonard, oh, Jab Judah, Winky Wright, and Pano Whitaker. Oh, and I got Whitaker. To, I, yeah, Sweet is uh, my favorite I, fighter. Yeah, I, I got to train with Pernell and be up under his wing for a little while. Uh, when we were training out before we had our own gym, we were training out in Portsmouth. I think uh, he was getting spat of form. I don't remember the guy's name, but he was training him. And my dad was getting my my brothers ready for the national power tournament. And I did qualify. So I got the opportunity to train under Pinot a little bit. Wow. He taught me a few things. So before he passed away, I would see him all the time. We would live around the same place. Hey, you get that that championship yet? Not yet. He said, don't worry. Keep going, champ. You'll get it. You'll get it. Kind of sucked that he had passed away before I won my world title, but yeah, that was a real tragedy. Yeah, I know that he would be proud of me, and if he was here, he would be at the scope on the twenty fourth. 
uh, smiling bright. You know, I'm be the first person to bring a fight home to the Norfolk School since Purdue did it against Wedding McGirt in 1992, and, and that was one of my one of my dreams. To just almost essentially sell out the school. Yeah, that's awesome, be, man. Be a be a representation of the hard work and dedication, even though. You know, Pernell faced his own personal struggles, and I've had my own personal struggles, you know, still we were able to overcome the moments we need to be in our lives. Well, that's, that's good to hear. It's an inspiration, man. And sometimes it might not be easy to recognize that when you're in a position like yours. But I mean, all of us are facing struggles every day. You know what I mean? And to hear someone like yourself, who's an accomplished champion, has to go through, you know, some maybe the same struggles that I am or some of our listeners or Paul might be facing is it's good to hear that everybody is human and everybody faces these struggles and see people overcome it. You know what I mean? You took the word out about I'm human. Just because I can fight and beat up people doesn't make me less of a human. Uh, and, and I have to, like when the kids, they see me in their room and all, I let them know, hey, I'm just like you, but God has given me some direction. And as long as I continue to communicate with him and, and believe in that direction and go towards it, and I'm going to get there. And I put in the work. The work, putting in the work is the hard. My legs hurt so bad right now. But I know I have a little gym later, and then I got to go for a run. But I'm going to do it. Am I run as fast as I normally would run a couple of miles? Absolutely not. Is it going to hurt probably a little more than it normally does? Absolutely. But I'm going to do what I have to do. Absolutely. Well, what can you tell us here before we wrap things up? Tell us a bit about Educated Hands University. All right. So, man, first you got to give a shout out to Antonio Tarver because he, he came up with the moniker Educated Hands. In one of the fights he said, it's going to be tough for anybody to get past the educated hand of Reggie Barnett and Jeremy. So, and I was just sitting down and I was thinking about it and I said, yeah. My brother went to college for eight years, a master's graduate. I went to college four times and dropped out every time. But it just wasn't for me. So I decided to take my fighting and my, and my lifestyle and turn it into my form of education. Uh, and when we talk about the Educated Hands University, it's a precept of that of helping you grow and advance in your fighting aspect, but also just in the mental focus. So those things are an important part of that, uh, the mentality and dealing with situations uh, in the ring and outside of the ring. But, so we started, um, like I said, my Sifu Rob, he came to me and we started essentially recording videos for you know, to teach people how to fight. And then somewhere in between there, I just started giving little life lessons and stuff in between, you know, when we shoot the videos or whatever, you can catch them. So um, it, it, it helps you prepare yourself or other as, a, as a, a combat sportsman. And as also, I hope, has some people as a person. And I've had one graduate so far, Chris Smith, and uh, he's done a lot of studying and a lot of growth you know, as a fighter and a person. I just want to leave a legacy behind, not just the fighting, which is the great part of it, it's what everybody wants, it's the entertainment aspect of it. So also, in essence, of people still achieving personal growth within themselves, within their lives, that transfers you know, into other people. Each one teach one. One, saving one can save a thousand. Yeah. It's in my mind, that's it's kind of how I, I approach things. So the university you can go online uh, under Udemy or just simply look up Learn Bare Knuckle. Yeah, we have videos up there. We kind of take a, a little bit of a break and a pause in between fights from recording and all that. So the focus can be specifically on getting ready for war. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to it being... Uh, I'm leaving a legacy behind, not just for me, but for the people behind me. Yeah, that's amazing, man. That's great. We're glad to hear it. Yeah, and that's great to see because not only are you teaching people all these different things, but I really feel like as a champion, you're pushing the sport forward. You know, we see all, at, like you kind of said earlier, you know, BKSD kind of evolves event to event to event. But like as you're a champion, like you're kind of leading the pack as like, this is what this sport can become. Like that, that's got to feel great as like, like you said, leaving a legacy. That's what I told my dad. I said, I'm 
born for this sport. There's a reason why I'm still here. And watch me not just change fighting, the face of fighting. I, I want to change the world in some direction. But, and I have been, and it feels good. And every time my music drops, and I know that's what I'm about to go out there and do, it just gives me a little more mm, to go out there and kick somebody's ass. Excuse my little <laughs> Well, we're looking forward. You know, you've got the big fight. It's BKFC 39. It's March 24th. Prior to that and after, of course, where is it that our listeners can find you online, on social media, so they can follow you, so they can learn more about you? What's the best spot for them to do that at? Um, you can hit up my Instagram. It's underscore right there on the tag, underscore E-A-Z, underscore E, underscore. That's my Instagram. On my fan page on Facebook, just ready, easy Barnett Jr. And then, like I said, you can, I guess, Google Educated Hands University. Or, okay, now we, we have, oh, there it is, educatedhands.co. I'm sorry. Oh, educatedhands.co. All right, yeah, great. That's, that's my uh, university main website, and you can go up there, and it provides the links, you know, not just to – my only my stuff but some of the resources that i use to get to where i'm going so you may find more use in some of those than everything and i'm teaching depending on what stage you are at your life and what goals you're trying to accomplish but that's what it's about having a platform to make that available to others so they can get to where they want to be Absolutely. And I'm going to enjoy kicking people with butts in the meantime. <laughs> we want to wish you the absolute best of luck. It's BKFC 39, March 24th. You're going to be defending that bantamweight title. Uh, people can order BKFC at Bare Knuckle TV or Bare Knuckle TV using the BKFC TV app. Thank you yep. so much for joining us. We wish you the best of luck in the fight, and hopefully, we'll have you on afterwards as well. Thank you guys so much for having me on. Um, I got a list of like 20 spawn crews. Please let us, let, let everyone know. Oh, um, yeah, let's do it. If I hit MMA, Gordon Custom, JK Style Group, Three Sixty Paving Services, Five Rooms. Yeah, Shore Construction, Inc., Joiner Driving School, Damware, um, yeah, Chesapeake G. Kendo, Walking Threat, my newest sponsor. Walking okay. Threat, nice. Yeah, and oh, yeah, Dapper Street Barbershop in uh, Virginia Beach. Man, yeah, like the support and the love for my community oh, is. Is awesome, and that's why we had a community event yesterday. This is a community event. You know, come out, hang out, play some games, eat some food. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, and we had a contest uh, for some local performers to see who was going to walk me out for my fight. So, oh, so awesome. yeah, you know, and so just local performers, artists from my area. Uh, they all, and the crazy part is they all wrote their own song for me. <laughs> That's <laughs> and we went up and performed it. Uh, so just providing those kind of opportunities. I would never get to do that for somebody if I wasn't where I am. So, so now me going to fight a main event fight for the entire world, this young man will have an opportunity to show his, his talent. Yeah, that's awesome, Absolutely. man. That's great. It's, it seems like you got a real sense of community going on, and and we want to thank all of the sponsors you named as well. Because if it wasn't for sponsors like that, you know, putting that out for you, then people wouldn't be able to watch and enjoy what you're doing. So I think it's really important our listeners check those out. And you know, thank you again for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me on. And uh, it'll, even if I'm a little beat up, bruised, whatever, we chop it up definitely after the plant. I look pretty good right now. But yeah. I already have the expectation that I'm going into war, and sometimes when you come out, you come out with a couple cuts and bruises. Yes, sir. All right. Well, best of luck to you, Reggie. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. You guys have a great afternoon. You too. Thanks, we'll see you. All right. Well, we want to thank Reggie Barnett for coming on.
and uh, we were really looking forward to his fight. So let's get into that. Yeah, let's talk about that. It's March 24th. It's BKFC 39. Now, there's BKFC 38 on the 17th prior to that, but we're going to circle back to that after we talk about uh, Reggie defending his title here. Yeah. Um, there's a reason that this guy is the number three ranked pound-for-pound pound fighter in bare knuckle. Yeah, just talking to him, you can really tell that like he was he's really engulfed in the culture and not and the um just the the whole feel of like not only the company bare knuckle fighting championship but like bare knuckle as a sport like pushing it forward like, yeah he's got the right everybody. attitude yeah. as far as this is an evolving sport there are yeah. different strategies that are literally being invented and tested yeah. before our very eyes mm -hmm. um and that doesn't mean every single fight on the card is mainly with these high level fighters yeah. um like Barnett, like Louis Palomino, like these other champions. And mm -hmm. I think that his experience versus Gustav Sedermalm here is just going to be the deciding factor. And I expect yeah. um, likely a quick finish. I'm predicting by round three, we're going to get a TKO from Reggie. Yeah, I could see something very similar to that. On this card as well, we do have a straw weight showdown uh, for the title between Britton Hart and Jenny Savage. That's the co main event. Uh, this should be a banger, too. I mean, Reggie's tied with Lorenzo Hunt having, you know, the most fights in BKFC. This will put him ahead of the curve now. And coming right behind him, though, is people like um, Britton Hart, who she currently is 6-3. and three. So she's got nine. This will be her tenth fight. Jenny Savage is solid. She brings a lot to the table. But I think the experience factor, once again, is going to be what decides this bout here. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that we kind of watch Britton Hart's like, whole game kind of evolve in front of our eyes also. She's like one of those fighters, I would say, too. Um, and I don't know. I think this is a good fight for her to like and continue to, you know. She rebounded good against uh, it was Sagala in her last yeah. fight. The battle against Beck Rawlings... I mean, I kind of, it was really close. I had it going the other way, I frankly. Uh, and then, of course, she was coming off the loss prior to that, the weight class above to Christine Correa, uh, the current champion, who, incidentally, is fighting on that gigantic BKFC 41 card. And we're trying to get her back on the show, if possible, before then. So stay tuned for that, everybody. Yeah. Well, are you picking Britain Hart here? You think yeah, the experience I got, factor uh, is just yeah. going to be. I got Hart. And I think she's got the drive. Again, not that she ever lost it, but I just think she's got a bit of more fire since the loss to Faria. Yeah. And the tough out against Rawlings. So now let's rewind it to the 17th is also a BKFC event, which has a very interesting headlining bout between a returning Dat win uh, to the weight class above that he ruled uh, at 145, fighting kind of an odd opponent in my mind, but it's uh, debuting Daniel Strauss, a former yeah. Bellator MMA champion. Yeah. Strauss is a he's a tough dude, but that win is like has such a weird style. I don't know. I'm very curious to see how this fight goes because I would think just based off of uh, experience alone that if I was Strauss, I would try to get in that clinch and use use what little MMA you can, but. Also, Dat wins really good in the clinch, and he's also really good, like, yeah. you know, uh, not getting hit. So this could be a really, like, really good fight, or it's going to get really ugly and physical the whole time because I feel like that's the way that Strauss could get out of here. If, if it's pretty, I see Dat win with a, a really good, uh, you know, really big win. But if it's ugly, it could be Dale Strauss's night. I think that's Strauss's key to victory is making it ugly and probably using his – he's a little bit bigger, his superior size in the clinch. Yeah. Um, at least I think he's a little bit bigger. I think it you – know, we talked with Reggie earlier a bit about the transition for boxers coming into a bare knuckle, and a lot of them haven't had success. However, Dat Wynn has adapted his style, I think, pretty well for the bare knuckle game, and that shows with the championship that he earned. Yeah. However, I don't know how that's going to fare against somebody as, as experienced in the clinch as Daniel Strauss is. So I don't really have a prediction on who's going to win. I, I would lean towards that win if I was betting, which I'm not. But I'm pretty excited by the card overall. 
we'll see what happens. I'm I'm curious if if a win here if that win gets the victory here. <laughs> I know it's I'm trying not that to win, love it. If that win that gets win. that win. <laughs> um there's some smoke between him and Reggie Barnett Jr. as well. Like yeah. Reggie really felt that win went way too far with some shit talking and they were scheduled to fight and then it fell through. And then of course Dat winds up leaving the promotion, vacating his title at 135. Um I wonder if they might clash in the future if Wynn is successful in his return. Yeah, I think that's a big fight as well for both those guys. Like that I was really looking forward to that fight before it got uh freaking canceled out. Yeah. And we got John Dotson trying to come in on the scene as well, throwing yeah. smoke at Reggie. So a lot of things in play just... and Dat Wynn's fight here on the seventeenth kind of uh plays into that because you if Dan Strauss comes in and plays spoiler and gets a victory over someone that's credentialed as win, then What's he might find himself into? inserting right into this mix here. And we could see something which I would find interesting, like a John Dotson versus a Dan Strauss would be interesting just based on the MMA history, you know. Yeah. That'd be crazy. You think Strauss would drop down though? Because he's his win kind I mean, of this is at up. 145. Yeah, I keep forgetting wins moved up, so I guess yeah. but still these are guys well win could definitely happen. come back at one thirty five. Yeah. But we'll see, we'll see. I just don't. I think wins too small for for thirty five or forty five. I mean, yeah. I do too. Well, oh. let's shift gear over, Paul, and let's talk about last weekend's main event in the UFC. Which, yeah. as a side note, it was nice to see it at the Virgin Hotel with a, a small crowd there. Yeah, you know. Uh, that seems to be like the new place we're going to operate instead of the Pearl at the Palms. Perhaps it was, it was way better than the Apex. Yeah, absolutely. So, so a, I was happy Everything. to see that. Um, I was surprised, but not surprised at the same time with the victory that Marab dished out. Wait, you know why it wasn't at the apex? Though, right? Actually, I do now that you said that. <laughs> It's because that stupid power slap <laughs> finale, wasn't it? 100%. Well, that's the best thing to come out of power slap, was that this card got moved keep to it the away fucking from version. It. Fucking, actually, I'm for the power slap. Get power slap going as long as it keeps us out of the apex. If it keeps UFC cards out of the apex, power slap, do your thing. Okay, well, let's actually, um, let, well, let's, before we shift into the next UFC card, I want to talk about Power Slap, but let's, let's finish up with this Marab yeah, versus yeah. Yon fight, but then let's talk with something about Power Slap real quick after that. So he gets the, Marab gets the, the blanket victory, 50 45 across all three. Um, he set a new record for takedowns at 49 attempted takedowns. He landed 11. That's almost 10 per round. Yeah. Um, he also threw over 200 strikes, uh, attempted over 400 strikes. So it wasn't like a bunch of lay and pray. Yeah. He was all over Jan. Jan could never, you know how he usually takes a round to get his feet wet, kind of yeah. figure you out and get going? Jan could Not never today. fucking do that. Yeah. Wasn't happening, son. Um, and this now makes it, what, he's one in three in his last four for Petra Jan. And we've oh, got. I think he's up four losses. Ten he's in a row now for round. Marab. Yeah. What. This is like such a weird spot for Marab because it almost feels like wasted, like wasted uh, performances sometimes because he's refusing to fight Aljo, which I can understand, but at the same time, I it, it's tough, you know. Well, for those listening, Aljamain Sterling is the bantamweight champion, and yeah. they are him and Marab are training partners and he best friends. Marab. Yeah. yeah. They're literally uh, according to both of them best friends and Marab's not going to fight him. Yeah. And on the flip side, Aljamain Sterling is throwing some talk about moving up to 145 possibly after his Cejudo fight. However, if he's successful against Cejudo, he may want to fight Sean O'Malley. Uh, yeah. but after that it could open the door, but we'll see. I respect him. I, I respect it. I like it, actually. I'm big on loyalty. I, I see what they're doing there. And if, if Marab is cool like that, then it's cool like that. I would rather they did that, honestly, than have the Rashad Evans-John Jones situation where they were somewhat of friends, at least. I don't know if they were best friends. Yeah. But they completely fell out, and it became like a fuck you situation, and one dude had to leave the gym. Or be a Colby Covington fucking... Oh, that's, that, that's a better... <laughs> 
<laughs> Although, you know, the championship wasn't at stake at that yeah, time, yeah, kind of yeah. like it was with John Jones yeah, they and Rashad. Just, they, but, yeah, yeah. I, I don't like that when that happens. And I really respect loyalty to yeah. your literal best friends in life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm down with it. Yeah, I just hope that at some point Aljo does move up. Some point soon. I can't see it. If it holds up things past the division. Well, let's just look at it this way. That's hard to justify. Let's just look at the landscape from here. Is you got to think, Al Jermaine, like you said, is obviously fighting uh, Cejudo in a couple months. So let's say he wins that fight. But the only problem is now you have Volkanovski and Yard Rodriguez, Yair Rodriguez already have to unify that title already. Mm -hmm. So that even puts him more behind the queue. And then, like you said, though, Mali fights there, but it really comes down to these two things. Like, do you think that you could make more money fighting O'Malley and continue into, you know, stay in the division? Or do you think you'd make more money fighting Volkanovski? Because I think Volkanovski is a better freaking money fight at this point, if you if you really ask me. I think what Volkanovski has shown in his fights in the UFC has made him into, like, a fan favorite. Like, people, people maybe don't, like, always... Like, he's not the biggest star in the world, but I'm saying I think he is on the same level as, like, a Sean O'Malley or someone like that, where if Aljo really wanted the money, I think the money would be fighting Volk versus fighting uh, Sean O'Malley. Here's my question, and I don't know if we even have access to this information. Because <laughs> I understand that argument. In most cases, I certainly used to agree with that. I find myself not agreeing anymore because I don't think the UFC operates that way any longer since the yeah. UFC's deal with ESPN. From what I understand, the UFC is guaranteed the same money from ESPN per show equal to a half a million pay-per-view buys. So that means they're basically getting a flat fee and then anything over a half a million pay-per-view buys, they're splitting more money with ESPN. There's more money for them, there's more money for ESPN. And if an event only were to sell, say, 200, they're still getting that same flat fee. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think that the UFC has ever shown that they're the type of company that's excessively generous where they're just going to give some of that money to the fighters suddenly out of that flat <laughs> yeah. fee that they're getting. Yeah. So I think that those pay per view points would only come in if it goes over that 500,000 threshold. And I don't see that happening with anybody outside of John Jones, Conor McGregor, et cetera. It certainly yeah. ain't happened with Aljamain Sterling. I love the dude, but you're going to get two hundred, three hundred thousand, and I that so that I could be completely wrong on this because we're not yeah. privy to all that information. But the latest shit that I heard, that's what it was. Which, for instance, was why they could never do the deal with Brock after the USB ESPN deal because they had that cap on the pay per view thing, and he couldn't yeah. get his money like he could before. Yeah, because it got whacked up with ESPN now. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's the only reason I disagree with what you're saying because I don't think the money fight exists. If you're not Connor or say John Jones, where you are going to get numbers that big, yeah. John Jones can't pull Connor numbers, but he's out pulling everybody else. I think that just showed. I don't know. I think Diaz and Jones probably sell. Diaz probably, close. but he's gone. Yeah. So. Maybe. At any rate, um, that's the state of the division. Tremendous performance by Marab. Mm -hmm. Jan's in trouble. I think he should go to BKFC personally. I think he'd be really successful there. I think he's got a great style. You want to hear a crazy stat real quick? I told you this earlier in the week, but I just want to bring this up. Mm -hmm. Peter Jan is the only win on Sean O'Malley's record that is still in the UFC. Is it in the, in the UFC? UFC? That's shocking. That really makes me question things because that was a tough out for him against Jan. Yeah, well, and people all just want to crown him the number one contender already and shit. But you got people like Cheeto Vera and That's Marab out stat. there. You got guys like Cheeto Vera and Marab fucking taking out all the all the killers, and mm. then people are giving Sean O'Malley the fucking title shot. Well, want yeah. to at least. Yeah, I don't know about that. I think Sean's got to beat Marab or Cheeto to get the title shot now. I well, think so too. Yeah. I think Jan's downward Obviously, trajectory we'll and O'Malley's inactivity is going to equal you got to fight somebody else. Yeah. We'll see. Exactly.
We'll see. Well, let's talk about UFC 286 now. Edwards versus Usman 3. We're going to focus in on three fights on this card. Uh, and it turns out they just happen to be the top three fights on the card. <laughs> so uh, what about Gunnar Nelson versus Brian Barberina? Now, this is a late-notice replacement uh, for an injured fighter. Barberina comes in, and it kind of changes the game up for me. Now, I'm a Gunnar Nelson fan, but we were going to specifically talk about the betting on this fight. You know, we're starting to want to give some more fight picks here, but instead of picking an entire card, we're going to focus in on one that we think can offer some value. Yeah. And I think right now the line on a straight win for Brian Barbarina is what, Paul? At most. Plus folks, 310. It's about plus 310. We've seen some it as high as 340, 340 350. Yeah. And it's likely quite higher. We can't get prop bets in information right now, but. Uh, props for him by KO are probably going to be something in the what I would have estimated in the f plus five range, five hundred maybe. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, now hopefully. I wouldn't pick in a straight, you know, fifty-fifty even split. I'm not picking Brian Barberina to win, and I wouldn't bet that. But at plus yeah. over plus three hundred, yeah, and possibly yeah. higher on a prop bet KO, I think that's a great value, and I'm going to bet him on a flat win for sure. And I'm probably going to bet a prop on him by KO depending on what that line is. I love Gunnar Nelson, but Brian Barberina is dangerous. Yeah. I mean, he's... Let's just take a look at some of the stats here. We've got Brian Barberina's almost six strikes per minute that he averages. Gunner's 1.8, so about two. Yeah, I think that plays into effect here. His accuracy, Gunner's is a little higher, but that doesn't really matter because that just means he's landed one of the two. Yeah. So 60%. I mean... Uh, Barberina's at 48, so he's landing almost three strikes. Yeah. And let's look at strikes absorbed per minute. Gunnar Nelson eats three per minute, dishing out less than two. Now, Brian Barberina's up there pretty high. That's his, his downfall, right? He goes in there and he slugs it out a lot. He's, he's eating almost five himself, 4.9. But I don't think he faces that danger against Gunnar. At most, if Gunnar puts 50% more of an output, he's going to be throwing three punches. Y you know, I mean... yeah. I think Barbarina also has something to prove because he kind of got fucked up by RDA in his last fight. He did, and now he's coming off. He was coming off that big win over Lawler, the big win over Brown. Yeah, I mean he was looking good. He's a big dude. Gunnar Nelson is well known for his jujitsu powers. Mm -hmm. However, let's just look at some stats here. He attempts less than than two takedowns per minute. He lands around half of them, and he averages less than one sub. For 15 minutes. You would expect more. I would think if I said, hey, what's Gunnar Nelson's submission attempts per fight, you would think it would be pretty high. Yeah, I wouldn't think. So I just think all of this points to it being a solid bet for Brian Barberina at fucking 3-1 to one or higher. Yeah, I, not necessarily saying that Gunnar's going to lose this fight. I'm saying that the, the odds that he could have an off night are better than fucking... <laughs> Plus three fifty or whatever the fuck it is. Yeah, that's a solid value. I think the value of that bet's there. That's what I am taking. That's what I'm taking for sure. But I do think Gunner's gonna win the fight. I'm gonna stick with actually. I think Brian Barberina is gonna pull it off. I'm gonna bet it and I'm gonna pull it off. I love Gunner Nelson, but he just he's been so hit or miss. I mean, he had he he lost to Burns. He lost to Edwards. He's got the win over Cowboy Oliveira. The loss to Ponzinibbio was not his fault. I mean, he took like three or four egregious eye pokes in the course of yeah. getting knocked the fuck out. He did have the win over uh, uh, Cowboy Oliver and uh, Sato. Uh, Takashi Sato. Takashi Sato. I'm yeah. just, and I'm just not feeling it. I'm too. not feeling it. I think the performance is from Brian Barbarina, and he's going to see this as, like you said, another opportunity for him to avenge a loss and continue that momentum he gained with the win over Lawler and Brown. Yeah. I'm picking Barberina all the way, and I'm betting it up. Okay. So there you have it. That's our yeah. bet of UFC 284. I think that's the best value right there, Barberina, and possibly Barberina by KO. Yeah. Now let's take a look at the co-main event. We got the return of Justin Gaethje, which is uh, going to have his hands full with <laughs> Rafael <laughs> Basib. <laughs> I was yeah. looking for the paper. I know I couldn't remember his first name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a. Uh, this is going to be a good fight. This is going to be a fire fight, I think. 
I really like both these guys. I mean, Gaethje, I think, is kind of in a crossroads position here in this fight for sure. Um, Because I think if he loses this fight, he loses relevance, to be honest. This, uh, you know, 155 division is so top heavy, man. Like, and it's just so easy to drop out of that. Like, you know, Zeev's like the new blood. He's coming in at 12 and 1. He's coming off some really impressive, impressive fights, too. I know. He's got a win over the aforementioned Hassan Joseph, went over with Dell. He took out Bobby Green. He took out Moicano. He, he beat Mark Diacasi also. Like, yeah, all he's those on guys. a streak here. Yeah. He's got a lot of power in his hands. His takedown defense is solid at over 90%. Mm-hmm. Not that he's going to have takedowns coming from Justin Gaethje. Yeah. I, I, I've long since believed quit believing in the Gaethje wrestling myth. It's not going to happen. This is going to be a firefight. It's going to be on the feet, or Gaethje's going to get taken down, possibly. I kind of doubt that, though. Yeah, and you know what I really like about what uh, has happened with Pazib? Like, he lost his first fight in the UFC, and, like, it was, you know, kind of a, like, a reality check, it feels like, because, like, since then, like, because he was just reckless in that first fight, got caught, got, like, knocked, like, flash KO'd. Um, and then since then has fought, you know, six fights in a row where he's just looked sharp as fuck, like defensively and on, on his feet. And uh, I like his progression of like opponents as well. Like he's, you can tell they've tested all the levels. Like he's had, you know, Diakasi who's a pretty solid striker. Then Moicano who's a, more of a jiu-jitsu guy. Mm-hmm. Bobby Green's more of like, you know, a street fight, like, you know, yeah, he's he's, he's very hands. unorthodox. Like yeah. he's not out here like really throwing some you know super technical boxing, but he'll but like very, he'll tag yeah, you he's up. Very odd angles. Yeah, he's a tough guy. And then Riddell, he's literally is he striking coach, so you know he's got some talent on the feet. He was able to knock him out. And that was a crazy fight too. They were fucking throwing hands. And then his last fight with Dos Anjos, he just looked fucking. Crazy. Yeah, he, he looked was amazing. Lighting on that. Dos Anjos up, man, it was nuts. And I think that's what's going to happen here. It's going to it's going to be the firefight, and Fazib's going to get the win. Yeah, I think so too. He's just on a roll, and this is going to announce him as a real contender in that one fifty five pound division. And he might find himself in line for, if not a title shot, because of the Connor Chandler shit, because that's undecided. If his, I hear Dana wants it at fifty five, Connor wants it at seventy. Connor tends to get what he wants. Chandler's down to whatever fucking weight. Yeah, um, but that's probably not even going to happen until what September. Because if Connor gets the win, they're going to give him a title shot. You know yeah. they are, especially with the TV deal coming up for renewal. They want to cash in on the McGregor shit as much as possible. Yeah, so he could get held off on the title shot and have to fight, you know, someone else in that top three. Well, that brings us to the big rematch: the kick heard round the world. Leon Edwards got the last-minute KO victory over Kamaru Usman in their second fight. Uh, yeah, Shocked the thing. world. And a lot of people are writing him off in this fight because of the nature of the first fight. He was losing. But that doesn't really mean anything because the kick wasn't a fluke. That kick had been there. He'd been setting that up. Yeah, and it I opened. do think there's something to be said about something that devastating happening to you as a person, like going into that next fight, like Usman has to know that's coming. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's something that has to be in the back of his mind every once in a while. You Unfortunately. Know, like, yeah. So like, I do think there's just a natural different respect that he's going to give to, um, Edward striking. And I think it's literally just going to, he's going to wrestle the fuck out of him. Like, I think that's literally what's going to happen. He's going to put him up on the cage, and he's just going to wrestle him for 25 minutes. And if if Edwards is able to, to fight him off, yeah, maybe he'll find somewhere to win. But there is no doubt in my mind that this will just be an endless effort for a takedown every round for Kamaru Usman. Not because he's, like, necessarily worried but just because he knows in that fifth round, all he had to do was keep him down, and he had him down, and he let him up. So I just feel like that's going to be etched in the back of his brain. He's like, we're going to the ground, and you're never getting up. And let's take a look at those numbers here when it comes to statistics with the takedowns and the grappling. I mean, it's it's pure dominance by Kamara Usman when you look at the stats. It just backs yeah. it up. You, you've got 
Uh, Edwards, 1.39 takedowns averaging, you know, per fight. Usman at over three. Takedown accuracy of Usman's is almost 50%. It's only a third for uh, Edwards. And here's here's the, the telling statistic, though, is the 97% takedown defense from Kamaru Usman. But who did it now? Leon Edwards. True. <laughs> True, <laughs> and I think Usman is going to make certain that don't happen again. Yeah, and that was so mind blowing when we were watching yeah. that shit, bro. Remember, we were watching that, we were like, "What the fuck just happened?" Yeah. Of all people, <laughs> so and Edwards' takedown defense, you know, sixty eight percent is solid. Yeah. But then when you look at who he's mm. been fighting, it has not been people with the wrestling pedigree of Usman. So I don't really think it. It qualifies for that. I don't think it's going to go exactly like you said. Usman has a point to make, and he's not going to. He fucked around and found out last time, yeah, right? He and he's not going to fuck around, around this time. So is, get your fucking wrestling shoes on and put your headgear on, son, because we're fucking wrestling for twenty five minutes. Yeah. That's what we're doing. That's There's what I'm no expecting as way. well. There's a lot no of wrestling, way. a lot of ground and pound, yeah, uh, a lot of work up against the cage, uh, leading to takedowns, yeah. A lot of body work. He's probably going to work the body. Hold. It's going to be similar to the Tyron Woodley, uh, I think, like plan he had. Remember, he just stifled Woodley, mm-hmm. punched him in the body three billion times, stomped his feet a few times, took him down, punched him in the body a whole bunch. I think that's what he's going to do to Usman. Oh, sorry, Edwards. Sorry, to Edwards. Yeah, yeah, that's a good <laughs> analogy, a good example right there. I think it's going to go much like a Woodley fight. Yeah, absolutely. And that's you, it. That's UFC 286. You, you take a new spin also? Yeah. yeah for right. sure. Now, let's, let's circle back. Well, I did want to talk about that power slap thing that you uh, that you, <laughs> yeah. you had brought up. Because you're right. Power slap, uh, the finale happened, and which is why we got the uh, Peter Yan uh, versus Marab was it Divalishi fight on uh, the Virgin Hotel. So... The head of the NSAC, who retired at the end of the December session, but was in charge when the Power Slap League was approved, yeah. came out publicly, and I believe it was the New York fucking Times in this <laughs> yeah. big interview, and was like, yeah, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done that one. Yeah, And there is now a lot of rumors, uh, and there's a little validity to this, because that they're going to lose their... Um, approval from the NSAC, which is why, if you listen to Dana White right now, you hear what he's saying? You know what they're doing for season two? Did you hear the big news? Uh-huh. It's Fight Island, Paul. No. They're taking it to Abu Dhabi. No way. Yeah, really? yeah, that's what Dana says for oh. season two. And you combine that with the fact that the fucking pay-per-view finale <laughs> that was supposed to happen, that we heard about all year long, wound up not being a pay-per-view finale. It was a that finale at the Apex was a free stream on Rumble. <laughs> they pulled out all the stops, too, bro. They brought out Hasbulla. They brought out fucking Mark Wahlberg. Like, they brought everybody out for that shit. Yeah, let's talk about that. I saw, because I don't watch any of this crap. I won't even give it a fucking <laughs> click. I don't watch But I saw this I thumbnail saw that said, like, Hasbulla refuses to slap Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. And I'm like, at what, at what point is, is this kid, this this man, going to be like, quit exploiting me, UFC? Because <laughs> the only reason it's funny is because he's tiny. Yeah. At what point does the joke wear off? He smacked all the contestants. <laughs> I know, and it's only funny because he's like, I don't know. I just I feel it's so exploitative. I mean, whatever people will be like, oh, he's he's doing it because he wants to. Okay, cool, whatever. <laughs> this only we only think it's funny because of his literal disability. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's He's, just weird. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to say that. I just don't get it. I don't get the whole fucking thing with that dude, and I fucking hate the power slap league. And now Dana White's trying to shuffle that crap off to Abu Dhabi, hoping that God the Middle Eastern fucking crowd is down with that shit. Because did you see their fucking finale? The on the televised finale was the lowest ranked shit it's ever been. Damn. It was like the number one hundred show that night. Ouch. And keep in mind that it had its lead in is the number one show on all of cable television. Did that you night, see that the AEW? Uh, did you see that uh, article that uh, the Vegas MMA ESPN reporter wrote about Dana? Also, and Dana went on ESPN radio and like fucking tried to trash him. Yeah, is it the one where he said they, they hate Mill me? One? Yeah, yeah, it was like this media guys they hate me. That's why they don't like power slap. Yeah, really? 
Yeah, well, how come the it, UFC is successful? If you actually read his article, it's not really about Dana White. It's no, that's not what he said. It's yeah. all about like actually what's wrong with power slap. No, that's Dana White's spin, but it doesn't yeah. even make water because this is the man who, after he slapped his fucking wife in Cabo, Started he said that he <laughs> no, he said that he can't be fired or he shouldn't take time off. Why? Because it'll hurt the UFC if he's not there. Yeah. And yet, power slap is not successful because he is there. Yeah. That doesn't make any fucking sense, homie. Yeah, it's true. Power slap. Is... No, that's just Dana White's a politician of the highest degree. Oh yeah, and power slap is awful. Well, that's what tanking. he said too. He was like, he was like, I'm here to make a to leave a little bit more of a legacy before I stop doing this. That's what he said to Megan O'Leary. That's <laughs> not a legacy, bro. That's like, a yeah. cash grab. You yeah, fuck. It really is. I want to say when you're offering two G's to these motherfuckers, oh, no, are they oh all the way up to ten grand? Who <laughs> Yeah. Motherfucker, you get you have the they have better luck just going and playing like roulette on the strip, or just like anybody. actually fighting or fight somebody for real. Yeah, fuck these slap fight shit. Because like slap way. fight, you just like get fucking knocked out for fun. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just it's a glorified strongman competition. I am not down with it. I respect Dana for what he's done for MMA, but he's just gone this overboard is, with this. Yeah. It's a cash grab of. <laughs> I Cash can't. I can't get past the sponsors. fucking like people. The argument. The only argument that I hear is people say, "Well, these people they're choosing to do the slap league, so they can do what they want. It's their body." Really? Then why do we have referees? Why are there corner men? Yeah. Why? 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 We don't. We don't need a referee. They're choosing to do whatever in that ring, right? Why do we need to stop a fight ever? Why does a referee ever stop a fucking fight? Then. Yeah. You know what I? I would love to sit in on that argument. You know what I would love to sit in on? Mm. The NAC's <laughs> training for the referees and power slap. <laughs> I don't even think they do it, dude. Because they act like that, though. Because have you have you seen it? I have not watched. Dude. I've I've seen the clips dude. that have been put out by the yeah. neurologist of the dude like going uh, into the fencing pose well, and the no. horribly disfigured face, dude. That I've seen that one. I'm That's talking it. about like. Just like the refs, though, are super extra in power slap. It's like the same guys from the UFC, too. It's like Jason Herzog and shit like that. And they're like, they're like, catch him. He's out. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh my God. God, dude. It's like fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I really hope the season two falls through in the tanks. We'll see. Yeah. I'm glad the pay-per-view couldn't didn't happen. It'll be on ESPN Plus. I'm glad that the finale was the lowest-rated show on all of cable, despite having the number one show. I'm glad it consistently went. Only week two had any type of bump up, and that was because after week one, people were like, "This is awful." Yeah, and people were like, "Damn, we should check this out. It sounds like it's terrible." <laughs> and then yep. they were like, "Yep, that. this is awful." Yeah. And that was that. Yeah. Well, that wraps the show today. <laughs> Head over to the UFC store. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It's kind of funny, but yeah, it is what it is. Call it like we see it on the show no, here. Really, Doesn't mean yeah. we don't like the UFC as I a whole. We've got problems with Dana, Dana White, White's man. got some shit going. And power slap happens to be a completely different thing. It's yeah. not the UFC. It's it's a Dana White thing. Yeah. So you can you can still head over to the our website, and you can click that link for the UFC store. Hell yeah! It helps support the podcast. Dude, and shit. click on those links for Bino White CBD if you're interested at all in our CBD products or. Uh, for now, legal Delta 9 THC products are from gummies to vape pens and more. You can save 20% on all those items by using our links at Wearfall. So I made dot com. You can head over there also and click the gear button to support the podcast. And then you can head over to Instagram and follow us at SWAT. Podcast. Thanks to Reggie Barnett Jr. for joining us. And be Absolutely. sure to check him out as well. Later, Peace. everybody. <laughs>